Okay, great. Welcome, everybody. Um, for all of those who are not familiar with us, my name is Abir, and I'm an intern at Africa for Palestine. We are uh, an organization that focuses on strengthening African-Palestinian relations and pushing back the influ um, against apartheid Zionist influence into the African continent. We work with solidarity groups, trade unions, political formations, and human rights organizations across the African continent who have the same spirit of progressive internationalism and commitment to standing with oppressed people across the world. And today we are really in for a treat as we have Ambassador Hanan Jarad with us today. Ambassador, how are you? Good morning. How are you, Abir? How, are, how is everything around? Uh, you know, we're doing good. I think getting used to the lockdown these days, I feel. But um, come on, we're moving into another level of relaxing the measures. Yes. And, yes. It's, it's for those who are not... Mm -hmm. For those who are not familiar with um, how the lockdown is going down in South Africa, uh, we, uh, it's been a, a more tougher lockdown um, so that the hospital system can kind of get in order and the country can prepare. And so we haven't even been able to take walks outside, uh, but this week we can finally take a little jog if we'd like or take a walk. So I think we're all excited for that. Uh, I'm just going to read Ambassador Hanan's uh, bio really quick. So Ambassador Hanan is recently is the recently appointed ambassador of the state of Palestine in South Africa. She's a lifelong activist, civil servant, and diplomat. Hanan began her career as a junior associate in the Department of Arab and International Relations in the Office of the Palestine Liberation Organization in 1997. She has held various positions within the Palestinian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and she was Director General of the Regional and International Relations Directorate of Women's Affairs, where she led the team in charge of establishing the National Committee to Combat Violence Against Women in Palestine. That's some amazing accomplishments, Ambassador Hanan. We're really, truly excited to have you with us today. Thank you, Abir, and thank you for Africa for Palestine for giving this uh, platform, uh, not only to target South Africans, but also to target other African countries. And in this regard, I really would like to congratulate you for the expansion, because uh, the African continent in general is very much important uh, for us, especially here from South mm -hmm. Africa. So good yeah. morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, so let's, let's get into um, our topic for today. So today we're going to discuss the impacts of COVID-19 on Palestinians living under occupation. And I think the, the, the first thing we should really go to is just getting a background. Um, tell us about the effect of the pandemic on um, the occupation of Palestinians. Um, how, when did it start? How, did the, how many numbers? How is it going? Yes. Um, first of all, the pandemic is uh, changing both global and local scene in Palestine. Uh, as the world seeks an effective global response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Palestinians hope for an effective international coalition to bring an end to the occupation. Uh, it's just as we continue to struggle to defeat the coronavirus, we will continue to our work for uh, achieving justice, peace, and uh, stability in, for, for Palestinians all over the world. Um, if we are going to talk about uh, the numbers and the statistics and the measures that has been uh, taken lately, well, we, we, we can say that um, uh, the Palestinian situation is very stable in terms of uh, the numbers, in terms of the measures that have been uh, taken. Uh, first of all, let me start by describing the numbers we have seen. Uh, right now, we have um, around uh, 600 confirmed uh, cases, uh, 500 has been recovered. The recovery um, uh, rate is very high, it's around um, 80%, and uh, uh, we have only three deaths. Um, these numbers we can consider as um, exceptional uh, because of the measures uh, that has been taken in a timely manner by the Palestinian mm. uh, government and the Palestinian uh, leadership. Uh, we have been into a state of emergency since the first of March, which is relatively uh, very early, uh, but because the Palestinians are aware of the situation, Palestinians are aware that they are that they will be under a double lockdown, under the Israeli occupation uh, lockdown and under the, the, the COVID-19 lockdown. So the Palestinian majority of the Palestinian population were very responsive. 
to the measures that have been uh, taken even before many other uh, uh, neighboring countries have taken these uh, measures. But because in Palestine we have a, a unique case or a unique situation, uh, as Palestinians we do believe that human capital is very much important. So we have to protect ourselves. Uh, we, were, we, we did not uh, need anything to really force people to stay at home uh, because they do believe that uh, uh, they have uh, many enemies uh, around and we have to take mm. care of ourselves. We know that uh, as a government and as a country, we lack the needed and the proper um, medical facilities to take care of us in case the numbers really increase. That's why people abide by the regulations and um, uh, the numbers were um, low relatively in comparison to other uh, uh, neighboring uh, countries. Um, uh, also, um, uh, the lockdown stayed, stayed uh, for around two and a half months. People were uh, totally uh, uh, obedient uh, to the regulations. Um, nowadays, it is, uh, thanks God, the lockdown has been uh, relaxed uh, to, mm. to, to the maximum. Normal life, we can say that normal life is returning back starting last um, uh, Wednesday. So uh, we do believe that uh, despite of all the challenges that uh, the Palestinians uh, were uh, facing, uh, their belief in the human capital was a crucial element in preventing the spread of the coronavirus, in mm -hmm. addition to their belief in uh, the importance of investing in the future. So investing in the human lives is very much important. Uh, so all these elements, the quick response by the government, the people awareness uh, uh, met together to uh, give us the satisfactory results that we are having uh, now. Okay, wow, that's really amazing to hear, Ambassador. Um, I didn't actually know that the recovery rate was so high and that there were yeah. such little deaths, but I'm <clears throat> not surprised because, um, of course, Palestinians are resilient. And yeah. uh, just as you were saying, um, this is not something new for Palestinians. I mean, the whole world is under these lockdown regulations, et cetera, but for Palestinians, they've been under much worse circumstances for so long. So, you know, yes. it was very yeah, easy. The, the, the lockdown was not something that it's new for Palestinians. They are used to it because mm. we have been under curfew for uh, uh, several weeks we have been facing the Israeli occupation for uh, for long so we are used to but because also sometimes the Palestinians have a unique uh, characteristics like for example believing in the investment of the future so mm. we we invest in the awareness of the people that's why uh, the response was very high from the population and they were in total obedience with the government's regulations and restrictions okay great um, and speaking of uh, the, the occupation and the effect that it's had on Palestinians. Um, I wanted to ask you specifically in terms of COVID-19 with the medical facilities and the resources that Palestinians have, has Israel compromised access for Palestinians in this regard? Well, actually, Israel is not only compromising the, the access to uh, healthcare facilities, it denies uh, all of the all the time, uh, whether it's a coronavirus or in the um, normal situation, usually the Israeli government or the Israeli forces um, um, deny the access for Palestinians to uh, healthcare uh, facilities. And and really, this um, takes uh, another dimension during the COVID or under the COVID uh, nineteen. For example, let's talk about Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is uh, East Jerusalem is the capital of the state of Palestine, as everyone knows and according to the uh, Oslo Accord Agreement. Uh, Israel refuses uh, the uh, reality and keeps saying that, uh, and according to Trump's plan that has been announced lately, they say that uh, you know, Jerusalem is a city that uh, is united under the Israeli uh, sovereignty. However, during the pandemic, the city is revealed as divided into two different sets of medical and social infrastructure and services. Not only that, uh, uh, around 100,000 Palestinians living in East Jerusalem were deprived from getting the proper uh, tests, the pro proper medications, uh, and uh, were denied access uh, to uh, proper health uh, facilities and infrastructure related to this um, uh, pandemic. Not only that, because uh, the Israelis did not want any kind of uh, voluntary action in this regard, they do not want to interfere 
or to prevent the pandemic. On the other hand, they do not want to do anything that might help. So they, many of the times, they sabotage any effort doing, done or conducted by uh, civil society organizations in Jerusalem to support Palestinians in this uh, pandemic. This is one, one small example of what's going on. Uh, another example is, is the situation in Gaza, as you know. Gaza has been mm -hmm. under the lockdown really and effectively uh, since 13 years now uh, with the total blockade uh, on everything, especially humanitarian aid, uh, help um, um, uh, medications and um, uh, facilities, uh, mm -hmm. turning it into a um, uh, very big uh, open air um, uh, prison. Uh, uh, another uh, issue is that is really um, was uh, seen as a death sentence during this um, uh, pandemic and under the Israeli occupation is the Palestinian uh, workers inside Israel. Um, mm -hmm. Many of the Palestinian workers have been infected uh, inside the Israeli workplaces. Once they are infected the Israelis wouldn't give them proper medication, wouldn't give them uh, any kind of assistance. They just ordered them to go back to their homes. Where are their homes? Their homes are in Palestinian lands. They have to contact uh, their families, their relatives, because they have been far away uh, for, for months. Mm. And we can say that uh, most of the people inside Palestine were infected because because they contacted in a way or another their relatives and their, their fathers, brothers, mothers who were working inside um, uh, Israel, unfortunately. Another mm. vulnerability under this uh, pandemic, which shows really uh, uh, very bad during this um, situation, is the Palestinians inside the Israeli jails. We have around 6,000 Palestinians inside the Israeli jails and in normal situation, in normal circumstances. These prisoners are usually uh, denied access to proper medication. What do you think now? Uh, in in uh, such a case of emergency, uh, of course, uh, they were also uh, denied access uh, to uh, proper medication or the proper facility that they might need in case they contracted the, the virus. Uh, actually, many Israeli uh, prison guards were infected and they were sent on purpose to Palestinians so that they might contract um, the wow. virus. Wow. Yes, especially taking in, into consideration that uh, among these prisoners, there are children, there are women, there are elderly and sick uh, people in prison. Many international organizations, uh, including the human rights and international law, uh, appealed to Israel to release those Palestinian uh, prisoners. Not all of them, at least those who really need uh, the, the, the care and the, the attention in such a difficult time. Yes. But of course, Israel would turn a deaf ear into all these uh, appeals as usual. Yes. Yes. No, I mean, that's, that is a lot of information and it's very difficult to hear because you're, you're mentioning so many vulnerable populations in society. First of all, you're mentioning this medical apartheid. You know, when there's an apartheid system, it's going to affect us during a pandemic because people who will not have yeah. access to the hospitals, yeah. et cetera. You know, you can divide apartheid into health or services or whatsoever. Apartheid is apartheid. It denies yes. your, your right to access any kind of uh, facility in, in the life. Actually, it, in the essence, it provides, uh, it, 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 it prohibited you from having your own ID as a human being. Because yes. It's, it's uh, it block it blocks your um, uh, access uh, to whatever really uh, strengthen your ID or strengthen your humanity as a human being. Yes. Well, it's yeah. It's just it's so sad to hear what's happening um, in the medical facilities in the, in. For the workers, I mean, this is something people don't think about, you know, who is working in all of these yeah. Israeli businesses and being exploited and catching the virus because we know that workers are the people who are most vulnerable to catching this virus. And then within Gaza, thank you for mentioning that, you know, I wanted to ask you about what's going on in Gaza, but of course, because they, um, they are isolated. They must be suffering so much and, and not having access to resources um, and then the jails. And so I actually wanted to to ask you because you were mentioning um, these kind of pleas to, to kind of get prisoners out of jails, et cetera, or maybe even, uh, I think there's some campaigns happening to um, end the isolation of Gaza. 
at the moment. Um, tell us what, um, how has the um, COVID-19 affected the international community's view of what's happening in Palestine? And are there any initiatives that are happening? Of course, the situation in Palestine is very much alarming, especially that taking into consideration that um, uh, the coming of the coronavirus uh, uh, coincided the forming of the Israeli um, uh, community government or emergency government, which is of course not an emergency government, uh, because uh, 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 conducting the third Israeli election in a year came at the same time that the coronavirus was really uh, spreading. Mm -hmm. uh, so this even uh, makes it worse for Palestinians um, uh, to, to handle the, the situation because uh, this unity government was formed under one uh, uh, purpose, which is to implement the annexation of the Palestinian uh, uh, lands, including the Jordan uh, Valley, which will um, leave um, a huge impact on the lives of Palestinians because you are talking about the annexation of around 30 percent of, uh, of uh, the land of the Palestinian uh, football state which means for the international community uh, leave the details of human beings aside which is much more important but for the international uh, community or the, uh, uh, the the countries or the state that has been supported the, the two-state solution for uh, 25 years now it means that that the closing the last window in the opportunity for having a two-state solution and for having a viable independent palestinian state so of course there has been uh, so many uh, appeals by the international uh, community first of all to stop the annexation plans because it's it's a devastating uh, um, uh, for the international uh, community and on the other hand we received many humanitarian assistance um, from different uh, countries we received assistance from uh, who we received assistance from arab countries mm -hmm. like uh, qatar we received um, assistance uh, qatar and saudi arabia and kuwait uh, from turkey from many other uh, countries who really realized that the situation might collapse at any uh, time because of, of uh, as I mentioned, the double lockdown that has been imposed on Palestinians due to the Israeli occupation at the mm. first place and to the coronavirus um, as a, a second uh, factor. So yes, the international community is really worried um, because of the situation in, in, in Palestine because both the political and uh, uh, the humanitarian uh, situation. Yes. No, and that's really important for you to be bringing up, Ambassador. I, I'm really glad that you spoke about these annexation plans because I'm sure, I mean, pe I'm sure people in Palestine are very aware of this, but internationally, the news coverage focuses on the COVID-19, focuses on the cases and the numbers, et cetera, but um, people are not realizing the political considerations. What are the political impacts of COVID-19 on the Palestinians? Yes, of course, but you, you know what is really saddens us is that, uh, unfortunately, while the international community and while the world is um, uh, 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 giving the, the importance for fighting uh, the pandemic and for fighting the coronaviruses, uh, the coronavirus, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, surviving uh, as a human beings uh, together in solidarity. Unfortunately, we can uh, see that Israel is uh, very much busy in making records and in, in uh, um, uh, occupying more land. And, and demolishing more of Palestinian houses and yes. raising more, more the Palestinian uh, cities. It's like that their occupation or that their racist machine cannot take uh, any kind of action unless it is really harmful for uh, for people. Sorry. No, that's fine. No, I mean, that's, um, I, I wanted to actually ask you about this because yesterday I saw, uh, I mean, I'm sure we hear about the, unfortunately, the killings and the deaths of Palestinians almost every day now. And uh, I, I'm sure you saw this too. This uh, young autistic man, Iyad al-Halak, was killed yesterday yeah. by the Israelis. Uh, I mean, just so inhumane. Um, and so I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, we've been seeing articles describing the abuse and the killings of Palestinian forces increasing um, under this out, the, this lockdown. So um, can you tell us uh, how are, you know, Zionist occupiers using the situation to increase the abuse that, suffer, that you know, towards Palestinians and the suffering towards Palestinians? 
as I mentioned, um, there, there is no consideration for because they are an apartheid state. Uh, how should they think in other aspects rather than uh, expanding their colonial expansionist project? So, and this reflects this. This leaves its effect on every uh, aspect of Palestinian life, as as for example. Uh, Around 193 Palestinian houses were demolished, demolished only in these two months, which gives you an indication on how these racists uh, act. Uh, they do not give uh, any consideration to any humanitarian or health aspects. They just only care about uh, their own interest, which expanding uh, their colonial uh, uh, regime, unfortunately. Um, if we are going to talk, for example, about the killing of Palestinian young men, if we are thinking about, because I, I really want to talk about um, this young guy, uh, Al Halam, he's a 30 years old, and I have a soft point to people who really have special needs, because I mean, it's very inhumane just uh, as a soldier to be so blind to, to an extent that you cannot realize that this person is really a special need person. He mm -hmm. can't. Um, he might not understand. It shows. It's it's easy for normal people, not for a well-trained army soldier, to identify a person who is normal or a person who is really had something uh, uh, that he might understand the language. He might be terrified uh, when he mm -hmm. see a soldier with the guns. And this is what the guy. Uh, what happened with the guy? He couldn't even because he was so terrified. He couldn't even bring the paper that states that he's a special need person and he's wow. going to his school from his pocket so they even they, they did not even let him uh, go and run away they followed him and they shot him eight bullets in his body can you imagine such kind of crudity my god no it's so, and um, this is one of the stories that shows the cruelty of the israeli occupation really yes i mean uh, just this this case <laughs> no i mean it's uh, you we should be getting emotional it's it's so difficult to hear um you know what's been happening uh, and I'm, I'm sure you're also seeing what's going on in the us um you know now there's like a lot of these uprisings so um under these circumstances people are affected by this pandemic people are dying from this disease and people are trying to keep their community safe staying under lockdown and yet you know these kind of abusive regimes and this israeli regime is continuing the killing of yes. people so inhumanely that it's even for a special needs person that they don't even care. Yes, even in the United States, I mean, um, there has been this slogan that we, I can't breathe. Also, we can't breathe. We have we we denied breathing for for long now, and I think it's time for people to really stand up in solidarity and stop stand up in uh, for their principles uh, to save the lives of, of innocent people from all this cruelty. Yes, thank you so much for that, Ambassador. And um, I think this is a really great note for us to end on this idea of solidarity, um, of you know, Black Palestinian solidarity, African Palestinian solidarity. Um, this update has been so helpful, and I think it's really important to, um, for people within the you know South Africa, within the African continent, to, to be hearing these updates on Palestine because people want to stand with Palestine. Um, and so maybe on the the last note that we can end on is. What are what are some things that you know people can be doing right now? What are some things to pay attention to, and what are some ways that people can help with the situation of Palestinians at this moment? Well, there you know it's difficult to ask people for assistance now um, because of the situation. I mean, uh, here in South Africa, we're still in the level three of uh, lockdown, so. Uh, but this doesn't mean that we uh, can close the window for any kind of, of uh, assistance. We can do rallies, virtual uh, interviews like this, raise the awareness of uh, people, talk to youth, because we do believe in uh, investment in the future. We need to talk to, to youth. Now, um, uh, we appeal, of course, to the um, government of South Africa to support Palestine. And honestly, they have been very vocal on uh, that, whether in the African Union, because South Africa now mm -hmm. is chairing the African Union, or in the uh, UN Security Council, they have been very vocal, very decisive, and very supporting the Palestinian uh, rights. And really, uh, from Africa uh, for Palestine, and from me personally, we would like to salute the uh, government of South Africa and the uh, people also of South uh, Africa, because they, they really uh, understand the plight of the Palestinians maybe better than 
maybe any other one uh, do, and this stands for um, Palestine. During the last period, it was very difficult to communicate, maybe uh, on the basis of one-to-one -one, uh, yes. interpersonal, yeah, some uh, interaction. But to be honest, we had uh, uh, many, many tens of meetings, the virtual meetings with the leaders, with the Kusato, with the uh, COSAS, with, with many organizations here in South Africa, and mm -hmm. all of them, uh, and with the Communist Party, of course, I would like to salute them, uh, with many other um, uh, parties and organizations, all of them were very supportive, and one of them really started uh, this kind of campaign to support the Palestinian prisoners inside the Israeli jails. So so no, there, there are many things to be done because we have everything. Uh, at least we have our humanity and we have uh, yes. this sense of solidarity that we should focus on in the coming um, period, despite all of the uh, economic uh, difficulties that might, and the social instability that might arise from this pandemic and the lockdown as a consequence. But still, uh, we can work together uh, to uh, stand for our principles and to raise our voice uh, to support um, Palestine and to support people who are really fighting for their uh, uh, dignity, for their living yes. normal life like, like other people and to, and uh, in their right to, in a liable right to, to self-determination and to have their own independent state. Yes, I think oh, that's, that's a really uplifting note for us to end on and uh, we really appreciate your update about what's been going on because you know it is really hard to understand what's happening on the ground to Palestinians, you know, how exactly they're being affected um, by COVID-19. So we really appreciate your update on um, how it's even, been affecting even people. They, they always say that devil in their details, and it's true. You can yes. understand the plight of the Palestinians until you go there and, and you see by your own eyes. I mentioned some of the vulnerabilities that we are facing, but there are many, because when we talk about someone who was killed, it's not only a number, it's not only a name, it's, it's a human life, it's a dream, it's a family, brothers, sisters, uh, mother and father. You know, it's, it's, um, it's difficult really to talk about people as only numbers or about houses as numbers. So it's difficult to understand or to really imagine the difficulties yes. uh, of the plight of the Palestinians until you go there and see by your own eyes. And this is uh, hopefully can be done uh, for as many as people who want to visit Palestine and see uh, and, and have the first hand experience in this. Yes, and I think that's a really important note that um, you know people need to be going to Palestine to see what is really happening. And unfortunately, as the rest of the world wants to return to normal, you know, after yeah. COVID-19, uh, Palestinians were never living under a normal circumstance, you yes. know, so we really um, hope and, and we'll work towards uh, a, a real normal, a real, you know, balanced and dignified society for Palestinians. Uh, so we really appreciate this update. And um, just on the note of the annexation, thank you for mentioning that. And I think you, as you, um, you know, it's something that's developing as we go. So we'd love to stay in touch with you, Ambassador Hanan, to just, you know, um, find out more updates as it's happening, because it's, uh, I think, something that maybe, you know, Israelis really want to go under the radar. And it's important that we're uplifting the story. Yes, yes of course, it's important. Uh... Hopefully we can uh, manage at least to do something by, by postponing or just uh, because it's another network for Palestinians. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Ambassador Hanan, for your time um, and for all of this uh, really useful information and for the empowerment that you have um, shown us and, and sh you know for showing us the way. Uh, we appreciate your time. And uh, for all of those who are tuning in, thank you for following us at Africa for Palestine. Please share this with your friends and on social media. It's really important for people to understand what's been happening to Palestinians. Uh, and uh, we hope that you're all well. My last announcement is that if you'd like to keep on supporting the cause for Palestinians in South Africa, you can purchase uh, these Africa for Palestine kufia face masks. Uh, I think we have a picture of Ambassador Hanan and her team also on our social media, looking really, really great wearing these masks. Um, but these masks are not, you know, they are really beautiful and they're really great quality, but they have an important message. They're a message of solidarity, you know, a message of steadfastness for the Palestinians. So. For folks who would like to buy these, you can find them on the Africa for Palestine website. Um, so thank you all for tuning in and uh, take care. Uh, goodbye to everyone. Salam to everyone in Palestine. Thank you, Ambassador Hanan. Thank you.
Thank you. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.